Well, this is our series, The Mysteries of the Kingdom. And of course, um, let's see, this would be 17, I think, in the series and still going strong here. Uh, but probably one of the more important series I've ever taught because the mysteries of the kingdom, you know, we see in Mark 4 that it's given unto you as a believer to know the mysteries of the kingdom, meaning they're not being withheld from your understanding. Uh, they are being saved for you. It's given unto you to know these mysteries, but they require revelation from God. These are the things that are not going to be a product of natural human understanding. These are things about our Christianity and our life in God that have to be revealed by Him. And He wants them revealed to you. Says that it's given unto you to know these things. Well, there are 10 different mysteries the New Testament talks about. Actually, maybe 11. Uh, one or two of them are fairly redundant. But basically, 10 mysteries that I'm going to be teaching about and, uh, you know, this is number six. So I'd say we might still be here next year this time. I don't know. But this is hugely important because to the degree that we experience revelation of God's Word, we grow not only in our faith but in His purpose and blessing for our life. Amen. Don't live in the dark about why this doesn't happen or why that happened or uh, wh why somebody died early or whatever. You can understand the mysteries of the king, things that will never be profitable to the natural human mind. It's given unto you to know these things. So, and part of the way you know about them is through the anointing of the preaching of the word. That oftentimes will bring revelation. You can learn, you can gain revelation sitting in your chair praying and spending time with the Lord about something and holding a particular question up to him. A lot of ways it can come. But it must come for you to realize the highest and the best that God has for you. And we're talking about now the most fundamental of all of the mysteries, according to the Word. In Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sower, uh, which we'll, we'll read from here in a moment, uh, the, the disciples didn't understand what he said in the parable of the sower. Remember, a parable is a natural analogy to, intended to illuminate spiritual truth. And the Bible's full of parables. They didn't get this one, and the Lord said, What? You didn't understand this parable? How are you going to understand any parable? Meaning, this is fundamental to life in the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, in verse 26 of Mark 4, he said, so is the kingdom. As though a man should cast seed into the ground. In other words, the principle of sowing and reaping, which is a mystery to them that are without, unfortunately is a mystery to many Christians too. But it's given unto them to know it. And he says, if you don't know this one, you're not going to understand much of anything. And so we see in the agricultural analogy uh, of sowing and reaping, we see that there is a natural seed that produces a natural harvest when it's sown into good soil, and that soil is properly cultivated. It says to us that since the soil that's being talked about is the human heart, and our first consideration has to be our own heart, and the cultivation of our own heart, in order to produce fruit, this has to occur, we can understand then that the seed within that context is the Word of God, the good seed that produces the fruit you want, but there's also bad seed that produces thorns, thistles, weeds, whatever you want to call it, that are designed by the enemy to choke out the fruit of God's Word. It's not, it is not represented that the opposite is ever true. The fruit of God's Word never chokes out the thorn or the weed. It's the weeds that choke out the Word of God and causes it to become unfruitful. 
And so, you know, the matter of cultivation begins with the soil being soft enough to receive the Word of God. Now, we're using, you know, the, the Word of God being good seed. That means God ideas, God perceptions of life and reality that come to us through the Word. Love never fails is a God idea. It surely isn't a world idea. By the stripes of Jesus, you're healed is a God idea. Surely isn't a world idea. So the bad seed are worldly, secular, humanistic ideas. The Word of God, the good seed, are ideas from God that will cause your life to be prosperous and blessed and for you to fulfill, fulfill His purpose in this earth. And so it's a conflict of ideas. What are you going to believe? Well, before you can receive God's Word, your heart has to be, since it's the soil that that seed is being sown in, has to be soft enough to receive the seed. And so a hard heart is the first soil condition we see, the parable of the sower, that you have to address. According to Hosea, you break up the fallow or hard ground of the heart by seeking the Lord by prayer. You get hungry for God and you start uh, communing with Him on any level, it begins to soften the heart so it can receive the Word. The second heart condition would be stony ground where there's not much depth of earth. So the seed can begin to take root, but there's not much depth of earth, and even though it might start to grow a little bit, as soon as the sun is up, as soon as the heat is on, as soon as the persecution and affliction comes, because there isn't any depth of root, this heart condition, you know, the person backs off the word as soon as hard, hardness comes. Any contradiction to what they were originally excited about, and they back off. They become offended. The solution is deep roots, putting down roots that can reach the, in the natural, the water table or the rivers of living water spiritually to sustain the life of that seed no matter how hot or how hard the going gets, you know, uh, in daily life, that seed will still grow and produce if the roots are deep enough. Meditation is the process by which that occurs. The shaping of your imagination, your ability to foresee future probability, which God says is huge, gives your life irresistible momentum in that direction. You've got to be able to see your life being lived out in line with what God says about you, the healed, the delivered, the set free, the prosperous. And when you can see it with your mind's eye, and that's the dominant reality to you of what your future probability may be. Imagination never deals with past or present. You know what that is. This has to do with your, the way you're perceiving your likely experience of life down the road. Are you seeing it like God says it is? Or are you seeing it like the world said? Well, you never know. You get this disease or that, you're going to die. There's no answer for it. Oh, well, you know, you tried that business thing several times. You went under every time. Don't, you know, don't do that again. Fear is born out of the worldly paradigm of what life is all about. And so as a conflict of ideas, you know, we see the, you know, the first two heart conditions being hardness or shallow, unrooted soil. Uh, the third we're going to read about today, this is the weedy heart. Part of the process of natural cultivation is getting rid of weeds, seed that is undesirable, that is choking out the the fruit that is wanted has to be taken care of. And so if we look at Mark chapter 4, verse 18, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Well, that's interesting. It had begun bearing fruit, 
but now it's become unfruitful before a harvest is achieved because the next verse is the harvest. So, you know, the, the, it's possible for two ideas to reside side by side in the same soil or the same heart. And, uh, you know, they'll both start to grow. And the good seed will even start to become fruitful. Meaning you'll start sampling a little bit of peace, a little bit of joy, a little bit of love. I mean, you'll hear the word and you'll, hey, man, that really brings peace to you, makes you happy, makes you want to share this truth with others, and the love of God begins to take over. You know, we see the fruit of the Spirit. That is the reborn human spirit with the seed of God's Word sown in it begins to produce love, joy, peace, patience, or long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, goodness, moderation, faithfulness, all of these things, they're internal changes. And this is simply saying, when you're starting to feel peace and joy and love, no matter what's going on in the world around you, your, your faith is matured enough. This is also a snapshot of how faith should happen in a person's life. Faith will come by hearing the Word, but you still have a responsibility to cultivate the garden of your heart that it's been sown in. And so this is a snapshot of faith's growth. And when you start producing peace and joy and the fruit of the Spirit that we see in Galatians 5.21, uh, then basically that's saying your faith is at a place now of maturity where you can make declarations, change the, the welfare of your body, your physical well-being. You can change your financial experience. You can change your relationships to line up with God's Word because your faith is at this point now. You know, so basically, the third thing that we see we're going to have to deal with, as we just read, if we're going to deal with the matter of weeding the garden of our heart, there are three categories, cares of this world, um, deceitfulness of riches, lust of other things entering in. Three categories of worldly ideas that will choke out the seed of God's Word. Not everything the world comes up with is bad. Not everything the world comes up with will choke out the fruit of God's Word. There's much truth in the temporal, natural world uh, that will work with spiritual truth to produce God's best in your life. You know, the, the physical truths that science has validated through the process called empiricism, through observation, experimentation, you know, uh, don't contradict the Word of God. God came up with the idea of gravity, you know, so you need to know about that truth. If you jump out of a tree, you can't use your faith to fly off. You're going down. That's just the way it is. That is a fact. Uh, there are physical, temporal truths that don't defy the Word of God. The Bible doesn't say beware of science. It says beware of false science. The, the, the Word and physical truth only seem to contradict each other when the science is bad or when the Word has been distorted by religion. An example of bad science would be evolutionary theory. Obviously, you know, the, there is no observation or experimentation to suggest that you originated in the goo, process, proceeded through the zoo to you. From the goo to the zoo to you, no. There is no basis in empirical processes to suggest that occurred. That's bad science. And yet our school systems have been sold that bill of goods. They have basically confused what is an environmental adaptation to suggest one species can actually become another. The missing link has never been discovered. So, you know, when, when you hear certain kinds of 
postulations being made about science, understand that if it's not rooted in the empirical process, it's not true. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the most respected scientific, I don't know how I got on this subject. <laughs> one, one of the most significant of the sciences is probability mathematics. And probability mathematics says that it's virtually impossible. You know, 10 to a billionth power that you happen by random chance that any kind of living creature or even plant life could have occurred simply by random chance. So just consider uh, the process of evolutionary theory uh, being an absolute joke and much of science that says, well, you know, we don't know where the spark of life came from, but here it is. And we don't know what happens when Death shows up, but, you know, we've got speculation. Well, that's where spiritual truth comes in. Fill in the blanks. Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? A God? A devil? Angels? Demons? What happens after death? You know, nobody in the natural arena can answer those questions. So spiritual truth becomes what, what completes the picture humanity needs to have. I don't even know how I got started on this. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I was saying, oh yeah, I remember. I was saying that not all that the world has to say is bad. Only that which contradicts the principle of God's Word. That's when they've overstepped their boundaries and you embrace the Word of God. And of course, uh, that conflict of ideas uh, we see will produce one of these three categories of weed that will choke out the Word of God. You know, cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, lusts of other things entering in. Every, everything that's dangerous to your, uh, the harvest you want to produce can be categorized one of these three ways. And that's why we're going to spend a, a sermon on each of them. The first being cares of this world. And of course, you know, uh, if you were to read the amplified rendering of this, which we're not going to take the time to do, it gives a little more of a definition to the word cares uh, than you might think. Most people associate cares, properly so, with anxiety or worry. And that's actually how the amplified reads, cares, anxieties, worries, but it, the Amplified has one other uh, little add-on there, uh, and that would be uh, distractions of the age. And so you can see that cares are not only fear-based, but they are anything that really becomes a distraction to your life, similar in concept to what we see in Hebrews 11 about, you know, uh, not only dealing with, with the sin, that, uh, the sin problem, disobedience to the Word, but the weights that so easily beset us. So there are things that aren't sin, but that will weigh you down. In a similar way, cares are not just fear-based things that produce anxiety and worry. That's probably the biggest, the biggest one to be aware of. But it can be distractions of the age. And why that's so important you know, what's the main distraction of this age, would you guess? Technology. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, there are good things about it, but I'm telling you, it will absorb every minute of your day if you allow it to do so, and many people do. But at any rate, let's deal with the fear thing first because the cares of this world, uh, you know, it does produce stress, anxiety, Worry, all of which is fear-based. I mean, we may not like to say, yeah, I'm afraid of this or I'm fearful of that. As a matter of fact, worrying sometimes even seems to be the responsible thing to do. If you care about somebody, you're going to worry about them. No, maybe in the world that's a viewpoint, but not in the Bible. 
because the word tells us, and I guess we should go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy 1 7. 2 Timothy 1 7. We'll deal with the fear element first. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Man, how many times do you hear somebody in total ignorance say, well, a little fear is good for you. Keeps you from crossing the street in front of the stoplight or something stupid like that. No fear isn't good for you. God hasn't given you the spirit of fear. When you feel fear, you know exactly what arena that is coming from. He's given you power, love, and a sound mind. And this is how you deal with fear. Power, love, and a sound mind. If there's something you fear, this is the way you begin addressing it. Be honest with yourself. If you have fear of something, and everybody does, there are different areas where you feel that little touch of uneasiness or anxiety. You don't like to call it fear, but it's fear. It's the spirit of fear. And this is the verse you use to, to learn how to deal with it very plainly and simply. Power, that's the Greek word dunamis. That's the word used for Holy Ghost power. When the Holy Spirit is introduced to us in the first chapter of Acts, uh, and it's talking about his enduing us with power from on high, the word power, there's dunamis. So this is Holy Ghost power, dunamis power that he's given us. And of course, uh, you know, that power begins to manifest as we re lean on and rely on the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. We have to acknowledge his ministry and begin leaning on it in order to benefit uh, from that ministry. Power is part of it. Power that you need in a time of maybe crisis. And the way you lean on the Holy Ghost is to pray in the Spirit. That is your original acknowledgement of the Holy Spirit that brings His fullness to bear in your life. And it's how you recognize that indwelling presence on an ongoing basis, praying in the Holy Ghost. Yes, we're a spirit-filled church. If you didn't know that, <clears throat> we're one of those bunches that speak in tongues. Because it's part of what the Word teaches. Amen. And if this is, uh, you know, a little bit unnerving to you, hang in there. You're about to experience a life-changing revelation. Amen. But he says that when we pray in an unknown tongue, we're making intercession for the saints according to the perfect will of God. And you are a saint. A lot of times, you know, who's being prayed for is you. And so if you're being threatened by a circumstance that would produce fear, the first thing I would say do is to pray in the Spirit. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've been flying for 50 years, still am, and will continue to until I fly out of here on that great day. Amen. Shout in the trunk. But, you know, in all of that time in the air, I've had some uh, nerve-wracking moments. Uh, and, you know, I learned early on the best way to keep a cool head and manage a situation well is to pray in tongues. And so many occasions, you know, uh, something would occur. And, you know, um, it's a little bit... Uh, implies, you know, the circumstance implies some potential negatives that uh, could be life-threatening, so you just pray in the Holy Ghost. Because it's important that you deal with a crisis in any area of life wisely. If you allow fear to remain, uh, it is a fact that fear will either paralyze you or cause you to run away. Paralysis or running away if you can uh, so, no, you want to get rid of it, you pray in the Holy Ghost. And uh, I have shared before, one time in a, on a, you know, uh, rainy night somewhere over Indianapolis or Indiana, I lost an engine on a two-engine airplane. 
and uh, felt that little touch of, of fear. And I was by myself, fortunately, because it's worse if you got people with you. Then you, got, you know. But anyway, um, so I was communicating with Indianapolis Center, and you know, in my uptight situation, I had gripped the control yoke a little harder than normal, and the mic switch is under the forefinger. So I had pressed the mic switch and was transmitting in tongues all over the upper Midwest. <laughs> and, uh, and the controller actually responded by saying, whatever my call sign was, uh, your last transmission was garbled. Say again, please. <laughs> so, I mean, you don't, you, this is a personal thing. You don't necessarily need to, to make it a public display like I inadvertently did. Uh, but you can pray in tongues when things begin getting a little threatening. And I promise you, if you understand uh, its effect on fear and the power that you're applying to your situation, then, you know, you'll feel a peace and a calm coming. And so power, love, of course, is the second part of a threefold cord. I want you to see uh, this passage in 2 Timothy as a threefold cord, power, love, and a sound mind. So you start praying in the Holy Ghost, rely on the power that you've been endued with. Secondly, love, the word agape means to give. It's talking about getting your focus off yourself and onto other people. Since fear is all rooted in self-concern, all fear is rooted in self-concern, love which turns your eyes off yourself on a daily ongoing basis. This is, this is more a pattern of life than an emergency procedure. Tongues in a moment of crisis you could call an emergency procedure. But love being someone that concerns yourself with others, even at your own expense, destroys the root of fear, which is self-concern. And then a sound mind is a mind that takes charge of its thoughts. A sound mind throughout the Word is a mind that takes charge of its thoughts, casts down vain imaginations, brings every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So when you have these three things going, the Holy Ghost, the love of God shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost, and a sound mind that doesn't let thoughts run willy-nilly through it, but brings captive every thought to the obedience of Christ, that's a threefold cord that the Bible says cannot be broken. Amen. And fear cannot find a place in your life. This is, this is an important understanding. So we see something here in this last of the threefold cord, a sound mind that I want to continue with. Uh, in, let's see, it would be uh, 1 Corinthians I should have this memorized. Uh, but, no, it's not Corinthians. It's Matthew. Matthew 6, 25. Thank you. Even I get confused sometimes in remembering Scripture, but not often. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought. Now, now God's telling us something about thinking and about cares. Because most translations of this passage that begins in Matthew 6, 25, uh, many translations use the word care. Take no care for your life. But he says here in the King James, take no thought, meaning there's a relationship between what you're thinking and the cares that may come. So he says, take no thought for what? For your life. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? You know, and this is repeated over and over. Verse 31 says it this way. Therefore, take no thought saying. Meaning you take a thought when you put words to it. First of all, thoughts and cares go hand in hand. 
Not every thought produces cares, or we'd really be in a world of hurt there. There's, there's good thoughts that will produce peace, joy, so on and so forth. But there are thoughts that will produce cares, anxiety, stress, worry, because they're fear-based thoughts. And so he says, don't take any arbitrary thought that flies through your mind, you know, uh, and you take it by talking about it. You take it by putting words to it eventually. As long, I mean, everybody has thoughts, wrong thoughts, bad thoughts, lustful thoughts. I mean, you can train yourself to reject a certain pattern of thought before it even shows up. But everybody has problems or challenges with their thought life because we're in a, a, an unglorified body for the balance of this, uh, this age, and that's just the way it is. And so you have a choice. You don't have to take a thought. You can cast it down. You can get rid of it, and you avoid speaking in line with that thought if you don't want to wind up taking it. If you're thinking, I don't feel real good today, I'm feeling a little achy, a few symptoms here and there, you sure don't make that pronouncement because you've taken a thought that produces the fear that maybe COVID is coming your way or some other ailment is coming your way. So, I mean, I'm not saying that you lie and that you say, oh, I feel great. You don't have to do that. That's, a, that's an untruth. But you don't have to put words to the negative thoughts. You know, and then there are always well-meaning people that say, well, do you feel okay? You don't look very good. Are you feeling okay? And you just say, I refuse to answer on the grounds it might tend to incriminate me. That's what you do. Or you think up some other, some other way to respond to it. But the moment you begin acknowledging with your words what it is you're thinking, you've taken a thought. But he says, therefore, take no thought, saying, what are you going to eat? What are you going to drink? Or wherewithal shall you be clothed? You see a pattern of anxiety that the enemy tries to bring, and it has to do with subsistence need. It has to do mostly with, uh, you know, needs you have in order to maintain what you would consider a, a minimally acceptable quality of life or a subsistence need. And he says, don't, you don't even need to go there. God says, just, you don't even need to go there. Next verse says this. For after all of these things, what? What we're going to eat? Where we're going to wear? Am I going to get a little beer this weekend? What am I going to drink? What am I going to do? Now, hey, all of these things do the Gentiles seek. Unbelievers, heathen peoples seek. But he says, your heavenly Father knoweth what things you have need of. And he says in the next verse, if you'll just do this, all these things shall be added unto you. You won't have to take a thought about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, what are you going to do, where are you going to live, who are you going to marry. You won't have to take a thought about any of these things if you're seeking first the kingdom of God. Amen. To seek means to focus upon, to make that the, the point of your attention. This is what you're giving your attention to, the kingdom of God, all kinds of wonderful things about the kingdom of God that you can get excited about. But the most important thing is the mystery we're talking about right now, the mystery of sowing and reaping which is how the whole kingdom works. He said, focus your attention there because this is how you operate in the kingdom of God. Two primary considerations. Make sure the seed you're sowing, or let's say it this way, make sure the influence you're exerting on other people about God, about how to live their life, is in line with his word, and make sure you're cultivating the garden of your heart. That's 
how the kingdom of God works. So if you're going to seek first the kingdom, these are the two things you take a good look at. How am I influencing people in the world around me? Are they seeing the principles to live by? Are they hearing those principles from my mouth? Uh, you know, or, or am I sowing that kind of seed? And secondly, am I tending the garden of my heart? Just as Proverbs 4 says, guard your heart with how much diligence? All diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. That's an Old Testament way of saying the same thing we see in Mark chapter 4. You're going to have to take care of your heart. How? Make sure it's soft, receptive to the Word. Make sure there's depth of root that you see in your mind's eye your life being lived like God said. And take care of the weed problem. Anytime there's a conflict of ideas, you're not going to produce any fruit, even though it may feel fruitful at the outset. It's not going to produce a harvest that you would like to experience unless you've got the weeds pulled that would otherwise choke it out. An example of that might be, I just talked to someone recently, um, you know, their view is, well, everybody, everybody has sex before marriage. Everybody has sex before marriage. I mean, that is the prevailing viewpoint of many of our younger, younger folks. I can't tell you how many people get turned on to the Word, come to this church, and they're living together. And sexual uh, behavior is, is, is happening, and they're not married, and they just, I mean, okay, so they get saved. Now there's a conflict of ideas. God says, if you want your relationships to work best, save that for marriage. It'll produce the touch of cursing and death in whatever relationship it occurs. Oh, but pastor, if, 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 if we don't know first that we're sexually compatible, it might not work. No, wait, 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 back up. If you want it to work, then you wait until you're married. And I, you know, this is not a popular message in this day and time. I've had people leave the church when they were counseled that there's a problem here, you're living together. And they were sharing expenses and everything else, and, you know, it just seemed impossible for the worldly wisdom to coexist with God's wisdom. And so what happened? the fruit that God's word would have produced gets choked out because that's not a step they're willing to take. And that's just one example out of thousands where, you know, two viewpoints try to coexist in the same life. Can't happen. So God says, seek first the kingdom of God. That's where your focal point needs to be. All of the things that God's kingdom represents and of course, that would mean the principle of sowing and reaping, the cultivation of your heart and the way that it should be cultivated, and your right standing with Him, which is what righteousness means. You've got to know that He's not your problem. He's not mad at you. Even after you sin, He still loves you. He sees you as forgiven because that sin was paid for at the cross of Christ. Now, you receive that forgiveness through your confession, acknowledgement that you, that you blew it and have a desire to, to change it. But, I mean, you've got right standing with God right now. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. If you're genuinely saved and born again, He sees your life through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That is a spiritual truth that nothing in this natural world can change. But when that spiritual truth is fully embraced by your faith and you see yourself this way, then things begin to change in the natural arena because that's the dominant realm of truth. So he says if you just will focus on the kingdom of God, the things that we've just mentioned and talked about, all of these things are going to be added unto you. 
And these thoughts that you're not taking anymore because your focus is somewhere else. And if one of them sneaks in, you're going to get rid of it. You're not going to put it in your mouth because that's how you begin to take it. And one last note of advice in verse 34 says this, Take therefore no thought for the morrow. Most cares have to do with future probabilities. Most anxiety and most worry has to do with what tomorrow looks like. And God said there's too much challenge going on today. You take care of today. You get rid of wrong thinking today. You sow some seed today. You cultivate the garden of your heart today. You take care of today. Take no thought. And therefore, as some translations say, care. Take no thought or care about tomorrow. For the morrow shall take care of the things of itself. In other words, you live one day at a time. We're talking about how to get a handle on cares. Whether they be fear-based or simply a distraction. You know, if you care too much about golf, it'll become a distraction. You can't think too much about flying. That's a God-given. That's, that's a God-given. But you can think too much about golf or or going and buying a new handbag or shoes, you can let that occupy your thinking too much. <laughs> if it's something that, uh, you know, I found myself before writing sermons, you know, and I've, I've got a deadline. I've got to get finished and get everything put together by a certain time. And I'm sitting there trying to write a sermon, and I'm thinking about going out and flying the airplane or maybe sitting in a tree stand or fishing, and I've lost an hour. That's the kind of distraction that the cares of this age is talking about. The biggest uh, threat is fear-based cares, and, uh, you know, and it's always rooted in tomorrow. So you can't let tomorrow get to you there. Uh, I do want to look at one last verse in 1 Peter chapter 5. Verse 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Now humility, not yet, not yet, go back. Humility is an essential ingredient for God to exalt you. He's not going to exalt someone uh, by his hand uh, to a level of success that pumps up their pride. Because that is a, you know, sure, surefire way uh, to, to rob God of the glory he should get. And you take it yourself. Look what I have done. So God exalts somebody who has humbled themselves, acknowledging they can do all things through Christ who strengthens them, but can't do much, can't do anything of any good, any lasting good on their own. And then he can exalt you. In due time is an interesting phrase, but let's go to the next verse because I want you to see that humbling yourself is defined as casting all your care upon him. We have different definitions of how we, we be humble. And, you know, we act all humble. Oh, yes, brother, you know. <laughs> Whatever, however we do that. You know, uh, we act real humble, uh, but he says, really, humility that he's talking about means you get rid of your cares because their first place in your thinking is opposed to his being first place in your thinking. When you get anxious, uptight, or worried about something, you're saying, ah, I better be concerned about this because God may not be able to handle it. Yeah, that's right. On some level, that really is what's being said. If I don't get involved, if I don't take care of this, if I don't, if I don't, if I don't. And he said, you get your cares off of you. Fear does that. It makes you look inward. Power, love, sound mind, not taking a thought by speaking it. Get your cares off of you. And truly, you've humbled yourself by doing that, and he will exalt you. But I want you to see the Passion Translation 
of these verses as we close. This is the passion. If you bow low in God's awesome presence, he will eventually exalt you as you leave the timing in his hands. Very often we get uptight about the timing. That's where we stress out. We believe the word. We believe that we're healed. We believe that we're delivered. We believe that we're set free. But when, Lord? I've been going to church every Sunday for the last six months. I've been giving my tithe, bringing my tithe. When, Lord? Why is this due season dragging on? Partially because this is the way you're acting. That's going to lengthen your due season. But timing is very often, you know, an issue in terms of our taking care about things. And so it says it's important that you leave the timing in his hands. You've got to get to a place in your thinking where you say, hey, you know, um, I wish this had happened, but it hadn't. All I know is that it's going to happen. I used to pray, you know, Lord, if I'll just cheerfully endure, I'll become perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And then, I, you know, time would come, I'd fuss a little bit and said, I've been enduring, and for the most part, cheerfully. So why am I not perfect and entire, wanting nothing? Perfect and entire. That's what your aspiration should be. All of the desires of your heart fulfill, the wrong desires having been purged, wanting nothing. That's our target. While we're on this earth, we don't need to cheerfully endure in heaven. We don't need those things in heaven. He's talking about the trying of your faith right here on this earth. So your target should be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I'll tell you, that Falcon 50 is a step in one of my desires that I believe were God-given. As far as the utilization of my aviation background in ministry, and of course, uh, you know, but those, there are those times when I say, Lord, I've, I've been enduring here. And then I have to remember, it really doesn't matter if I know that I'm going to be perfect and entire, wanting nothing, I can get happy about that right now. Yeah, you know, it might be tomorrow. Yeah, it's been longer than I've wanted to this point, but it might be tomorrow. It could be tomorrow. I'm going to believe it's tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes, I'm going to believe it's next, the next day after that. Just keep yourself engaged in the truth that you can be perfect and entire, wanting nothing, if you remain consistent in your faith, in your belief system, in the hard places that come, cheerfully endure and remain consistent. Then the outcome is un, it's not negotiable. The outcome is a settled fact. You will arrive at a day when you are perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You, you can look at your life and say, hey, I, I really, I, there's nothing more that, that I want. I got everything that I want. Truthfully, you will be able to. And if you believe that, uh, then the timing is an issue. Don't ever let the timing become problematic.